and thank you to the Jack Straw Cultural Center and Joan Rabinowitz and Levi uh, Fuller for creating this dynamic and nurturing uh, uh, vortex of the arts, really. And so <clears throat> now um, the first reader is um, Steve Griggs. Steve Griggs is a jazz musician I should say he's an amazing jazz musician and a writer who brings his deep knowledge of the musical history of Seattle, which is a lot of musical history, as you know, you may know, um, to the page. Steve is an award-winning composer, producer, performer, and publisher. Um, he has six jazz recordings of his music on his independent label, Hip City Music. His writing about music has been published all over the place, including Earshot Jazz, Raven Chronicles, and the Seattle Times. So please welcome Steve Griggs. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Um, uh, I'm really honored. Um, thank you all for being here, and thanks for Jack Straw. They've been supporting a great partner for a lot of my music projects, which I recorded in this room. So it's uh, great to be back here with all of you. Um, this, I'm gonna read uh, my piece from the anthology. Um, it's a little experiment for me doing uh, an essay. Um, uh, I brought a little bit of my memoir in, um, but I found myself in recent days musing on um, the legacy of recorded music in Seattle. And so it prompted this question, how long should music last? Time beautified is music. Time beautified is music, suggested musicologist Isaac Rice in the late 1800s. Time and beauty weave a sound with unity and continuity, euphony. Music, ephemeral, evanescent, fleeting, fugacious, an invisible field of feelings like Gravity, magnetism, quantum mechanics, and morphogenetics. Can it last? How long? Can I make it last longer? First, consider the quantifiable. A flute made of bare bone found in a cave was crafted 60,000 years ago. A 4,000-year-old Sumerian clay tablet contained music notation. A marble column in Turkey from the first century AD marked a woman's grave with an inscription of musical notation and lyrics that read, while you live, shine. Have no grief at all. Life exists only for a short while and time demands its toll. The toll of time. There was a time when the sound of a bell could be heard only when struck and then remembered silently until on Monday, January 26, 1857, a Parisian named Edouard Leon Scott cleverly asked in a design application to the French Academy, and I quote, can it be hoped that the day is near when the musical phrase escaped from the singer's lips will be written by itself and as if without the musician's knowledge on a docile paper and leave an imperishable trace of those fugitive melodies, which the memory can no longer find when it seeks them. His invention, the phonautograph, a device which scribbled on a piece of moving paper the sound wave present. The present sound became available to the future as an image transcribed on paper, not just notation to be interpreted by a performer. Sung melodies were no longer fugitive, Memory could count on an imperishable reproduction in print. 20 years later, another Parisian, Charles Croce, imagined a paleophone, a device to inscribe sound wave oscillations on a rotating cylinder, trumped by Thomas Edison's phono phonograph prototype a year later, which used wax-coated cylinder to record and play back Mary Had a Little Lamb. Everywhere that music went, 
A flock of recordings was sure to follow. Now music, beautified time, could live beyond a moment, place, source of creation, transforming any future moment desired with captured sonic sculptures. Music recorded on wax cylinders was sold commercially, and forevermore, musicians referred to recording as making wax. An early version of commercial cylinder recordings was sold in cans, coining the phrase canned music. Early record players were sold in furniture stores and moved records into most households by 1920. 30 million records were sold in 1910 alone. Subsequent technology employing electrons for microphones and speakers, magnetic particles for audio tape, radio waves for wireless transmission, laser beams for compact disc, and silicon circuits for iPods, iPads, iPhones, merely modified the convenience, length, fidelity, fungibility of recorded reproductions. How long is music on recordings these days? Well, according to the website Big Time Musicians, the average length of a pop song is three and a half minutes. Rap, just under four. Rock, four and a quarter. R&B, just over four and a half. So soft boiled eggs and hard rock have time in common. <laughs> but what makes music, some music feel better? In the case of jazz, it is a matter of subtle timing, a slight delay in synchronization between musicians. People report that the small delay makes music swing harder. The exact amount of time? A theoretical physicist named Theo Geisel collected data that points to 30 milliseconds. Just that little shift changes the sound from mechanical to human, from stiff to soulful, from tight to write. The drummer's right hand stick on the wide ride cymbal splang dang -a lang links the low bass thump from fingers pulling gut strings, setting a rock steady beat hipper than any metronome. The other musicians hold back their notes to challenge the beat, weave awake, surprise the sound. Jazz synchronizes a handful of musicians, but how can a whole orchestra traverse time together? The baton is not a mechanical device like a second hand on a watch, but it can shepherd a large flock of musicians forward through a score, a magic wand that points, parries, and pirouettes. I recalled a conducting masterclass held one morning at Carnegie Hall by French conductor Pierre Boulez. In the darkened theater, dotted with conductors, scores for La Mer by French composer Claude Debussy open on their laps, a young conductor lifted his baton in front of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. Down it came for beat one and snapped to the right for beat two. The opening strain of musical depiction of the ocean oozed into the air. Stop, cried Boulez. The baton slowly sank to the stop beside the student's leg. The sea of sound ceased. You must give the orchestra the first beat, then wait. A silence filled the hall. Wait until the orchestra gives you back the sound of the first beat. Then you can give them the second beat. Soft clicking of bows on music stands signaled approval of the assembled performers. Watch. Boulez traded places with the student on the podium. With no baton, Boulez lifted his hand into the air. Musicians raised their instruments to playing position. Boulez's right hand came down and bounced slightly. A moment later, the orchestra swelled. Boulez lifted his hand, and down it came again. The musical sea rose, li waves lifting waves. Then Boulez waved his hand, silencing the sound. Lesson delivered, Boulez sensed an opportunity for deeper insight. He lifted his bare hands and began to sing. His hands floating, undulating, splashing, became the oceanic music, while his voice sang the orchestral parts using solfege, French syllables, for each pitch in the musical score. French music, French conductor, French vocal syllables, voila. There is an Italian word 
important for orchestral synchronization, rubato, or robbed, literally stealing a little time from this or that beat and giving a bit more to another. The music stretches and shrinks over a steady pulse to add emotional color at the minute level of feelings below the conscious mind, subtle indeed. These issues of timing control performance in the present, but what are recordings made to capture these subtleties? Recordings of feelings in sound. I remembered a visit to San Francisco. While ordering coffee in a Haight-Ashbury cafe, a recording of rhythmic acoustic guitar beckoned in the background, part samba, part sax, part bossa nova, smooth, serene, seductive. Seductive. Soon, a male voice singing in Portuguese entered, João Gilberto, like a hum, a hymn, hypnotic. To even say his name required my mouth to not trust my eyes and find a new dance. The opening consonant J sounds like zzz, like Zsa Zsa Gabor, or the OAO form a diphthong, kind of like ow with a swallowed ending. The G has the same zaja sound as the J, then Ilberto with a swallowed rolled R that sounds like a hint of an H. Just like music, the look on the page misses the feeling of the sound. I could not translate the Portuguese lyrics, but the timing of the words tickled my ears. The words ran way ahead of the guitar accompaniment, phrases ending early, leaving room for the ticking time of the guitar and it sounded so deliciously good. Normally, anticipation of the beat creates tension and anxiety, but Gilberto's timing did the opposite, like a trick where the barbell is a balloon. Mastery becomes mystery. The feeling was weightlessness, floating, carefree, hopeful. With the knowing wink, I realized that timing was everything, a magic portal to the palette of people's feelings. I had to have the recording. The barista showed me the CD, a self-titled reissue. I immediately sought a store and purchased a copy so I could have physical proof that alchemy was real. I could enter that feeling on demand. Just press play. But what of music recorded and not commercialized? Uh, jam bands Grateful Dead and Fish have legions of followers who record their improvised performances and barter bootlegs like rare baseball cards. The bands create a community of caring curators. But not all musicians have large audiences, especially jazz musicians like me. And not all of recordings are shared widely. For example, a Seattle saxophonist Joe Brazil recorded live performances in nightclubs so he could study and learn. Jim Knapp, a Seattle composer, recorded performances of his work to document his oeuvre. Jim Wilkie, a Seattle radio broadcaster of live music, recorded what he aired to review the success or shortcomings of his microphone placement. These recordings, made for personal and artistic reasons, are a physical artifact of a life in music, jazz in particular, Seattle specifically. They are lightning in a bottle group improvisation caught on tape or computer, but without an interested descendant headed for the landfill because they take up too much space in a dark basement. This music, this beautified time may be stopped in silence forever. There are gems from these doomed collections. They've been polished and published, have already won worldwide Acclaim and awards, John Coltrane, A Love Supreme Live in Seattle, Ahmed Jamal, Emerald City Nights, Cannonball Adderley, Swinging in Seattle, and several more. What more can be mined and minted? What else can be heard and heralded? What lessons could be learned? I want these messages from the past to find a home, like this place, <laughs> a place to survive, to last long into the future, a living room to share their stories with us, their neighbors, nieces, nephews, now and into the next generation, at an address where this local music took its first steps and later ran full throttle out into the world. Jackson Street, a historic trunk of tolerance connecting the roots of Seattle, a waterfront landing known as 
little crossing over place by the indigenous Duwamish tribe, renamed Pioneer Square by the colonizers, to branches of the city's non-white residents, Asian, Pacific Islander, Jewish, black, musical pioneers like Jelly Roll Morton, Ray Charles, and Quincy Jones composed, improvised, and nourished themselves here because the rest of booming white Seattle kept them out. Music, beautified time, could be preserved. Necessary noise for the next of us. <laughs> 